Just oiling the journal boxes on one of the cars, you remember we talked about uh, how roller bearings replace the old friction bearings on cars, and that really made a big advancement in railroad technology? Friction is a railroad's best friend and its greatest enemy. We'll explain on this episode of our behind-the-scenes tour here from the Lake Superior Railroad Museum in beautiful downtown Duluth. Come and visit us. The city's mostly open. The museum opens on Wednesday, July 1st, and we start running trains that very same day. Friction is what made railroads possible. They reduced it. Steel wheels on steel rails, very little contact, and you could move a lot of heavy equipment, merchandise of people with very little energy because there was no friction. Anything you can do on the railroad, though, to reduce friction, well, that made that job easier. So your best friend and your worst enemy. That's why we oiled the journal boxes and invented roller bearings. And that was fine when you had coaches because think about it, a bearing with grease, we had that down in the horse and buggy days. But now the steam engine, why that's a whole different animal. And it's got a whole bunch of more moving parts that need to be oiled. And here we start with that story right now. Friction on the railroads. Look at all these moving parts that have to be oiled. All the rods, all the pistons, and oh, the piston itself. Now not just putting oil on the outside, we have to figure out a way to put oil on the inside of the piston to lubricate that piston as it moves back and forth inside the cylinder. Well, the earliest version was what was called an oil cup, and it was pretty simple. You filled it up with oil, and it just dripped into the piston. Not a lot of control, and you had to keep filling it up. Heaven forbid you should run out. More importantly, as it went down the track, it was sloshing in and out, and so you had to constantly be filling it, which means you couldn't go very far or very fast. And that was a problem that was facing John Rapsbottom. He was an engineer engineer in the UK, and he came up with what was known as the displacement oiler. John Ramsbottom's 1860 invention of the displacement oiler was really a breakthrough. And what he did was he put all the oil in here, then he fed steam into it. The steam would reach the top, and then it would start to cool. It would form water. And as we know, oil floats on top of water. The displacement was the water now pushes the oil up out these tubes and into the pistons and into the air pump. There's a line for each piston and a line for the air pump. And you could adjust how much oil was going to each one and see it through this sight class here. This was the Detroit version of this, Model 21, and these were very popular. There were lots of advantages to this because it was in front of the engineer in the cab and he could make sure that the oil was being applied. Also didn't have to stop, you just had to fill it occasionally. And the best part was it kept getting advances. In the 1890s, a man by the name of Charles Wakefield improved this even more. There was the Nathan oiler, again, more improvements. And it seemed like the displacement oiler was going very well, except for the facts that if the engine isn't moving, and you're not putting steam into the boiler, from the boiler into the piston to move it back and forth, there's no oil. But yet, as you know, when that engine coasts downhill, the piston is still going back and forth in its cylinder. But now it's not getting any steam, and therefore it's not getting any oil. A better way had to be invented, and it was. And this is where we meet Elijah McCoy. As engines started to get bigger, and trains started to run further, longer, and faster, more improvements had to be made to the oiler. We were looking at the Detroit displacement oiler in the cab of the William Crooks. Well, they had to get bigger for bigger locomotives. There was also those problems with the displacement in that when the engine's coasting, the piston is still moving, but because there's no steam getting injected, there's no oil either, and they were very weather dependent. Inventors came along with other ideas. One of them, was named Elijah. Elijah is the son of escaped slaves that left Kentucky during the Civil War and emigrated to Canada. The young man is a genius. He goes off to Scotland to study mechanical engineering and returns to this country but unable to find a job. He is drawn to the railroads and works for the Michigan Central Railway as an engineer. And there he discovers all the problems with oiling faster and bigger locomotives and he comes up with a better idea. 
Elijah patents that idea in 1872 and goes on to patent other improvements along the way that actually led to this Nathan mechanical oiler. He had 57 patents in all, the most of any black inventor of the era and by many standards today. He was a genius. And because there were so many competitors, like the Nathan, like the Detroit, like the hydrostatics that were still around, you never knew what you were getting when you stepped into the cab of a locomotive. Some railroads would experiment with this, others would use that, and of course it was very confusing. Engineers of the day knew what they wanted though. They wanted the one that Elijah made, the one that Elijah invented. And they would ask for it by name. Not his first name, but by his real name. His last name, McCoy. They wanted the real McCoy. And now we ask for that for just about everything. And once again, if you work it hard enough, it all comes back to the railroad. Come back to us tomorrow for another exciting adventure of our behind the scenes tours. We're closing in on our 100th episode. Make sure you're here by washing your hands, covering your coughs, don't touch your face, Keep a social distance. If you're sick, there's only one place for you, and that is at home and back with us tomorrow. And in the meantime, let's take care of each other.